Good evening, everyone. This is David DeSmith from Southworth Marketing, and we're honored to be joined tonight by David, Mc David McClay Kidd, live from Bend, Oregon. Welcome, David. Thanks very much. It's only uh, four o'clock here. <laughs> well, thank you for, for joining us tonight. I know that uh, a lot of people are interested in, in you and your career and your golf course designs you've done through the years and your, your strategies for golf course design. So I know this will be a fascinating conversation for everybody. And, you know, I'm, I'm particularly thrilled to have a chance to talk with you tonight. Um, just real quickly to give, uh, you know, people a little bit of background. Uh, and we'll talk some more about this with David later. But David has had a long and wonderful career as a golf course designer. Um, grew up as the son of a course superintendent, the famous Jimmy Kid of Glen Eagles, uh, and many other places. Um, and David went on from there to design uh, a number of just outstanding golf courses, beginning with Bandon Dunes and Van Court, uh, Gamble Sands, um, Makrahanish Dunes, of course, one of the Southworth properties, and more recently, Mammoth Dunes out at the Sand Valley Resort in, uh, in Wisconsin. And look forward to hearing more about uh, some of those, David. But I wondered if we could maybe start with just a little bit about <clears throat> your background and how you uh, fell in love with the idea of golf course design. I know you worked for the Southern Golf Construction Company for a while and, you know, got to see shapers at work and pitch in with all that. But love to hear just, you know, a bit about how you got into this business. Well, I'm the I'm the son of a greenkeeper. I'm, I'm not sure if you can see my screen, but that is my dear old dad right there. Uh, there he is. Uh, and... You know, he is now in his mid 70s, but he was a greenkeeper in Scotland his entire working life. Uh, and in the early 60s, uh, I guess the late 50s, uh, he was the eldest of seven uh, in a small village in Scotland called Bridge of Weir. Uh, and he won a scholarship to go to grammar school. But unfortunately, his parents said that as the eldest child, they couldn't afford for him to go to grammar school, even though he won a scholarship. Uh, they needed him to go out and make a living. Uh, so he was sent out to the local leather works uh, to, to learn how to tan leather. And in his first few weeks, he uh, put his hand in the wrong place and one of the drums rolled over his right hand. And the factory manager uh, said he wasn't any use in the factory anymore. So. Uh, the owner took him up and put him on the golf course, which was lucky for him and really lucky for me uh, because my father l grew to love the game of golf uh, and loved the landscape, loved everything about it. His father, my grandfather, had been a farmer, so there was a connection with the land. Uh, and so uh, he spent his uh, latter part of his childhood on a golf course and in his early 20s, uh, he became the youngest head greenkeeper, uh, we believe in Scottish history. I think he was 23 and he was the head greenkeeper at Glasgow Golf Club, which is the sixth or seventh oldest club in the world. Uh, and that's where I was born, right next to it. And so my whole entire life, I was in and around golf courses, not the uh, playing golf as a professional uh, sort of uh, way, more in the greenkeeping in the dirt, digging out ditches, mowing greens, raking bunkers kind of a way. So I learned all about golf from the dirt up uh, and was very passionate about it. Like my father, he he grew to love the history of the game and he spent a lot of time uh, buying old books and finding old plans and reading about the history and then trying to understand how these courses in Scotland had morphed and changed over decades in fact over millennia uh, and frequently our kitchen table was was covered in these old linen uh, maps that had been drawn a hundred years earlier and my father would be trying to figure out uh, who had drawn them or what they showed or where a golf hole had gone a long time in the past it was like detective work so those were my earliest memories of golf course architecture. Uh, we're seeing uh, my father out in the in the dirt and his joy and love of golf course history. Uh, and of course, that history has a lot to do with architecture. 
And of course, uh, Jimmy now was involved with the the design and the construction of the centenary course at Glen Eagles, if I'm not mistaken, which many years later, uh, you were called in to make some revisions to. Is that correct? You know, I, I was. I, probably around maybe 2000, let me think now, 2003, something like that, the uh, Glen Eagles was owned by Guinness and they were attempting to win the Ryder Cup bid for uh, Scotland uh, for the 2014 Ryder Cup. And they wanted to put it on the Nicholas course, uh, which was called the Monarchs and then changed its name to the Centenary course. And so my father asked if I would make some adjustments. The course had held a couple of tournaments and there were some obvious tweaks and adjustments that were necessary. The biggest of which, uh, which is uh, you know, still a debatable subject, was the first major tournament that, that got hosted on the course. Uh, it was a par 72 that Nicholas had designed and it had three par threes, three par fours and three par fives on each nine. So par 72, but with six par fives and six par threes. Uh, and ostensibly, you wouldn't think there was anything wrong with that. And I'm not sure there is anything wrong with it. But when a major corporation hosts a major tournament, the pros can take that apart. Uh, all the par threes, they can birdie, right? There's almost no way of stopping that. All the par fives, they can probably birdie. It's hard to stop that. And then the par fours, they're going to try and birdie all of them unless they're 500 yards long. So what happened the first year was Adam Scott won the tournament at 26 under. Uh, and that really uh, sat uneasily with the owners and they wanted to see what they could do to uh, tune it up a little bit and make it a little harder for the following years. So I started making uh, some tweaks to, to Nicholas's original design. I lengthened some of the par fours and fives. I even took one of the par threes and made it a short par four, uh, but lengthened it all the way out. You know, it was 320 yards uh, to try and inject a, a little more mystery in what was going to happen. And it, it wouldn't just be the bombers who were winning. Uh, so for over three or four years, I made these adjustments uh, and the pros would come back each year uh, and the course would have changed. So after about I don't know, three years or so of this, uh, Lee Westwood was playing the course and he came in, he was doing pretty well. He got to, I think the final round uh, and on the fifth green, he four putted and he basically took himself out of the tournament and finished, you know, 10th. Uh, and he went into the media tent and he railed against the superintendent's son who was making the changes, that would be me. Uh, and was really upset about it. So I got a phone call, I was here on the West Coast, and I got a phone call from the golf writer from the London Times. Uh, and he said, you know, Lee Westwood just uh, used your name in a press conference. He said that his two twin daughters could design courses better than you. Uh, and I'd been given a tiny heads up before the call of what had taken him out of the tournament. And I said, well, my daughter's only three and I think she could putt better than him. Uh, and the end of the story was that the fifth hole that he'd four jacked, I hadn't actually touched it. It wasn't a green I'd ever been near and I never was near it. Uh, <laughs> so that one was all jack. Uh, but shortly thereafter, <laughs> I decided that uh, it was a thankless task uh, and I politely I, I fired myself from that task and Jack came back and he made a few more pretty major changes uh, to the course for the 2014 Ryder Cup. And they were brilliant changes because we won handsomely the European team. So all power <laughs> to Jack changes. That's a great story. He's back here. If anybody's watching me, here's Jack back here. Oh, there he is. Yeah. Looking over me. So David, um, obviously getting the job to design Bandon Dunes uh, was a big jump start for your career. And, uh, you know, it, it certainly must have been, you know, a bit of a leap of faith for Mike Kaiser out at Bandon to, to choose you. I'm sure people would love to know how that process worked and, you know, what you said and showed to Mike uh, that landed you that, you know, incredible job and led to that unbelievable golf course out there. How did that all happen? 
cool. That's that's a story. One I'm often asked. Let's see if I can stick a picture of uh, of Bandon up here. Uh, well, what happened was Mike Kaiser was asked. Uh, he, he took he bought this land. He was desperately trying to find the perfect piece of land in America to build a links course, uh, and he searched all over he hired someone from chicago a uh, full time to try and find a piece of land and they looked all through florida and the carolinas and down into california and along the gulf coast and they hunted and hunted and uh, over the course of a few years uh, nothing really came up that suited mike's purpose he wanted something that was a thousand plus acres on the sea sandy uh, that he could get a permit for uh, and on one of the trips that his uh, the architect he tasked to find the land, uh, a chap called Howard McKee, he looked at a piece of land for sale on the Oregon coast, and it it was one of three or four pieces that that Howard took to Mike in their regular monthly visit. Uh, and Howard said, "I saw this piece of land on the southern Oregon coast, but I I know that it's not what you're looking for because uh, the weather there is absolutely." horrendously bad uh, and the land is covered in this yellow flower you can see it in this photograph if you're able to see here uh, and this yellow flower is a noxious weed called gorse uh, and that one word made the difference between Bandon dunes happening and not happening because Mike as a aficionado of Lynx Court Golf in the British Isles knew that the plant that exists on every single one of those golf courses is in fact gorse. In the UK, it is not a noxious weed, it's a, it's a native flower. So that grabbed Mike's attention uh, and he took it upon himself to go out and look at the original 1600 acre parcel that was for sale uh, and bought it nearly on the spot and added more land over the coming years. How did he end up talking to me? Uh, you know, he talked to everyone. It wasn't just that he talked to me. Uh, he talked to, you know, as far as I could tell, everyone had been out there from Pete Dye to Jack Nicholas to Tom Fazio, you know, all of the, the really legendary golf designers uh, had been on the site. Uh, and none of them had really resonated with Mike's vision, which was a classic British Isles Lynx course. So his friend back in Chicago, because Mike was in the publishing business, he had a friend called Rick Summers, and he was uh, uh, ruminating with Rick one evening that he had the land, but now he had to find the designer. And Rick said, well, why don't you hire a Scotsman? And Mike laughed and said, well, the, the last time they had Scottish architects was 100 years ago, and they're all dead now, so uh, there are no Scottish architects. But unbeknownst to Mike, Rick was good friends with my father and he also knew me and I was a young uh, wannabe golf course designer and Rick suggested that he invite my father and I out and we spend some time wandering across this land that he had bought uh, to see what we would make of it. So my father and I flew out in July 1994 uh, and wandered across the 1600 acres and hadn't met Mike yet, he flew in a week later and we uh, proposed our ideas. Uh, the really bold part was that by that point, I had figured out that we weren't alone, that Mike was sophisticated enough to have spoken to all of the designers of the day. And we were lightly nothing more than amusement for a, a Chicago billionaire uh, to, consider in a rueful way about whether to hire these inexperienced sort of yokels from Scotland. So I told Mike really what I absolutely thought. I, I figured I couldn't win the job. So at the very least, I would leave with my head held high. So I told Mike that if he were really going to build a Lynx course, uh, there were a number of things that he couldn't do that I had seen all over the United States. I saw courses that called themselves called themselves Lynx courses, whether they were in Florida or California, and they were nothing like Lynx courses. And I told Mike, if you really want to do that, you leave the best land for golf. You stick your clubhouse somewhere else. 
Uh, you don't put cart paths in and you don't provide golf carts. You make them walk. Uh, and there would be no separation from tee to fairway to green. It would be one grass, the same everywhere. Uh, there wouldn't be a flat lie out there. Uh, and there would be very little vegetation. The, the trees that had grown up uh, would be removed and it would be taken back to the dunescape that the Native Americans would have known uh, before we all arrived. Uh, and Mike and his uh, advisors kind of laughed at me uh, and they departed. Uh, and I thought that I was indeed leaving with my head held high. But on, who knew, a few weeks later, Mike called me and he said, you know, did you really mean what you said? And I said, yeah, absolutely I did. I mean, these are all things, if you really are true that you want to build a Lynx course in America, this is how you'd have to do it. You, you, can't, it, you can't be halfway pregnant. It's all or nothing. You have to go all the way. Uh, and no one's coming to Southwest Oregon, from what I could see, to play a golf course that was trying to compete with a course in Florida or Arizona or Southern California. This had to be completely unique, something that America didn't have yet. And so Mike, over the course of many months and turned out many years, uh, extended our conversations and I drew little sketches. And I, I think I may even have some in here somewhere. Let me see if I can uh, show you guys the kind of things that uh, I was showing Mike. So it was things like this with all the trees were gone uh, and it was kind of wild and scraggy and out there by itself. Uh, what else do I have here for anybody that knows it? 17, you know, this is this is the 17th hole. And compared to what Mike was looking at, he was looking at something that was covered in commercial trees at that point. Uh, you couldn't see the open nature of the ground. Uh, and so these were somewhat shocking to him at the time. Uh, but it, it, it all came together. I, I worked from 94 till 90, seven, uh, helping them through the permitting process. And then in August of 98, we started building the golf course. And we built the course from August 98 until the US Open in 99, uh, that was at the Olympic Club. Uh, David Duval was the number one in the world. Uh, and this young guy called Tiger Woods was appearing out of nowhere and showing that he could win everything. So that's how long ago it was. That is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, the, uh, the the world very quickly beat a path to the to the door at Band of Dunes when they when they heard about it, when they saw the pictures, you know, when they learned the story of how it had been created. And it's obviously not an easy place to get to. Uh, you know, I have to ask, did did a part of you think that Mike was crazy? Uh, not to me. I mean, I didn't think he was crazy. Uh, uh, later on, I probably did. But at the time, I, I didn't think he was crazy. He was, you know, he's a very uh, savvy guy. He's nobody's fool. Uh, and by that point, he was in his mid 50s. And he had concluded a, a, an incredibly successful first career. Uh, it was obvious that this endeavor wasn't going to break him. Uh, you know, he bought the land uh, debt free and we built the golf course for three million bucks. So he, with the asset of the land and the risk of three million dollars worth of golf construction, I, I don't think he was going to starve if it didn't work. Uh, did that, he still could have been crazy, I guess. Uh, his fallback was that if he bought the land and built the course that he wanted and it ended up only being played by him and his friends, he'd still feel like he achieved something. Uh, I'm not sure any of us had any clue what would happen. I mean, I think Mike thought that he was trying to introduce caviar at Denny's, you know, and there might be a couple of people might like it, but generally they're going to go right back to, you know, moons over my hammy. Uh, he had no clue that uh, what he was tapping into this latent desire for authenticity. Uh, and that's what Bandon is. And that's what it still is fairly unique today. There are very few courses in America that are as, as 
authentic as Bandendunes. There's lots of courses that talk about it, but not very many that are. Uh, right. And that makes it extremely unique. And every client I've ever had since, they always want the same thing. We want some of that Band and Dunes magic. Uh, and of course, that magic is the site itself. You know, if you look at the picture that I have on my screen right now, as an architect, you know, I can maybe take 10% of the credit for that, but 90% of the credit is not mine. Well, speaking of, of working on, you know, interesting sites, um, you know, that takes it takes us to Makrahanish Dunes, um, where I know you spent some time in that area as a as a youngster and um, you know, as Brian Keating and and those guys were, you know, considering building a second golf course there in Makrahanish. Um, you know, your name uh, was on the tip of their tongue very quickly. Um, but that uh you know, again, another course that was built with very little money um, and that had to use a lot of the existing topography, but um, with severe environmental restrictions on the site. And um, I'd love to hear you talk about your approach to solving that problem and figuring out a way to get a golf course built on what was, uh, you know, triple SI environmentally protected land. All right, well, the first thing I'm gonna do, this is one of my missions in America, is every single time in, in Scotland, you see the letters C and H together, it's <laughs> So you gotta try that one for me, David. Mach. Machrahanish. Machrahanish. Machrahanish Dunes. There you go, right? And whoever else is listening, I can't hear you, so you can try it too. Machrahanish. It's a, it's a very guttural thing. It's almost Germanic, uh, right at the back of the throat. So if you if you don't want to get overcharged in a bar in Scotland, you have to learn how to say Machrahanish or Loch Lomond. Uh, so there you go. There's your Scottish travel tip for the day. Uh, Cheers. Yeah, my, my backstory with Machrahanish uh, is that my grandparents uh, vacationed here uh, every year, two weeks every year, the the Glasgow fortnight they called it, which I think is the first two weeks in August. And so all the factory workers all got the same vacation, the first two weeks in August. And my grandparents post World War II would come here. And so my mother would come here with them. That it was my maternal grandparents. Uh, and then when my, my mother and father met when they were in school, he tagged along uh, and slept in a tent nearby. Uh, so my uh, my association with uh, this place is my entire life now, well over 50 years, and my family is well, it's pushing what 70 or 80 years. So we spent a lot of time on the beach at Macrahanish uh, and playing the old golf course that's there, the old Tom Morris did at the turn of the the 1800s to the 1900s. Uh, so. When I played the old golf course with my father and my grandfather, we would get out to the turn on the old course and we would look out across all the dunes. And my dad would say, because he was a greenkeeper and he loved golf course architecture and history, I wonder why old Tom didn't build another or wonder why someone else didn't build another. So it was always in my head that there was this choice piece of duneland on the Scottish West Coast that could host another golf course. Uh, and after I finished Bandon, I tried my hardest to to bring uh, developers, Mike Kaiser being my first choice, uh, to help me build the golf course that was here. Uh, and by one thing and another, as I went and tried to buy the land from the farmer, I didn't realize that he had a verbal agreement with a guy called Brian Keating, uh, actually with a guy called Brian Morgan, who's a famous golf photographer, that if anybody ever turned up and seriously tried to buy these dunes, that farmer would call Brian Morgan and at least alert him to the fact that something was happening. So Brian got that call because I had stirred the pot. Uh, and to cut a very long story short, uh, Brian Keating, uh, an Australian, ended up purchasing the land and starting the development that the Southworth company eventually finished. Uh, and the, the biggest task of all was getting permission to build on the sand dunes. Uh, we were asking to build a golf course on uh, a piece of land that the European 
government designated uh, of, of European uh, federal uh, interest. I mean, incredibly, incredibly protected. Uh, I, I'm not sure what the equivalent in the US would be. Probably something like a state park, you know, like trying to build a golf course in Yellowstone. Uh, it was it was incredibly almost laughable to ask, uh, but ask we did. Uh, and the case we made was that the the land, although incredibly fragile, uh, wasn't being protected. It was it was being used as winter grazing by the farmer. He was turning out all of his cattle uh, from November through March onto it, and they were trampling over it, crapping all over it. Uh, he was putting old machinery on it, emptying oil uh, onto it. I mean, it wasn't being protected at all. And so the argument we made was if we could find a way to build a golf course in the most sensitive way and not damage what makes the land special, the golf course would be the engine, the impetus to create real protection. The only reason we want to be here is because of these fragile dunes. If and when we could create a golf course, the golf course would create its own economy, which would help the, the rest of the land. We would actually have economic incentive to protect it. And I, I believe then and believe even more so today that if we can find real economic incentive to protect fragile environments, that's going to be their uh, best long term sustainable protection. Uh, a, a designation by our government can be removed. Uh, the designation can be got around. Uh, so if the, the very existence of the land creates uh, an imperative to protect it, then that's its long-term uh, protection. If you take Bandon Dunes, uh, that land now is incredibly fragile. All sorts of native flora and fauna has re-established that land and Mike owns something like 4,000 acres and each golf course is only about 100 acres and there's five of them. So there's 500 acres of land that's being used by man, but the imperative protects three and a half thousand acres forever. So it's a far better model for long-term protection than purely a designation, I believe. Uh, and in a place like Macrahanish, we that argument won out uh, and the local people agreed and then the national people agreed. Uh, and the golf course got to be created. It was unbelievably light-handed, however. There was no, if on a scale of one to 10, if Bandon Dunes, well, let me say, if if Shadow Creek in Las Vegas was a 10 in terms of how much work had to be done, Bandon Dunes would be a, a two. Macrahanish wouldn't even register on it. It would be a 0.1. So almost nothing happened. The picture that you're looking at now, everything but the green was already there. That that grass in front of the green was the grass the sheep were actually grazing on. Uh, the bunkers, each and every bunker was debated over. If there was a natural rabbit scrape or cattle damage, then we were allowed to build a bunker. If there wasn't, there had to be a lot of debate about it. So that bunker next to that green, there was a lot of debate about why did we have to put a scar in the landscape in that particular location and we uh, had to educate the environmental team about what golf was and why it would be interesting if we did that and how we could do it in a very ecological way that it wouldn't be highly manicured because they would look at pictures of Augusta and that would be their worst fear and I would show them pictures of Bandon Dunes and they'd say yeah but you know is that really what you're going to do so it was a challenge the whole way through and even today, I think that Macrahanish Dunes is a poster child for environmentally sustainable golf, not just its de design, but also its development and its long-term maintenance. And I, I think you just told me yesterday, David, that uh, for the first time in 10 years, Macrahanish Dunes now sits with uh, ranking parity with uh, old Tom's work that's 120 years old next door. So. Uh, it's being only 10 years old in Scotland is pretty young for a golf course. So I, I think it takes about 100 years for golf courses to get their true ranking. So we've got a ways to go. Right. Well, I actually told you that it has eclipsed its neighbor in the rankings, but you're too uh, you're too kind to say that. Um, 
but you know it, they certainly are you know together an amazing one-two punch uh, golf destination and Makrahanish Dunes you know because of the way that it was that it was created is full of surprises and asks you to be creative and imaginative you know probably in ways that manufactured golf courses often don't um and i'm curious as to whether you know any of the things that uh that you did or or may have learned in the creation of makrahanish dunes um carried over into any of your subsequent work well here's me and old tom uh he's about 200 years old there uh you know, I, I I think I take something from every project we've done, and you you roll it into the next one. The I, I think the most valuable thing that we learned from Macrahanish Dunes was uh, how we could uh, communicate our intentions to the government bodies, the environmental groups, how we could communicate uh, our intentions, and then deliver on those promises that we had made. You know, Macrahanish did that. It, there are a lot of developments. The 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 one that I probably would go to would be uh, the Trump International course up in Aberdeen, uh, that you know made a lot of promises and then fell short on them. Whether it was the their approach to designing construction or the number of jobs they said they would provide, you know, all of these kind of things. There was a lot of developer hype, uh, and they it fell short and it's left. Uh, a pretty bad taste for golf development in Scotland. Uh, only a few weeks ago, Mike Kaiser uh, got re rebuffed by the Scottish government. Uh, he wanted uh, Bill Coor and Ben Crenshaw to build a course uh, up near Royal Dorna. Uh, and I think probably as a direct result of, of what had gone on at Trump Aberdeen, uh, they didn't get a chance to, to do that. And so I think that's the lesson I learned the most was the, the politics of uh, explaining what it is you're going to do and bringing the local people with you and having the patience and uh, the take the time and trouble to explain it and try and not be a threat. Uh, and there are two very different approaches, I guess. I mean, Macrahanish was more than a decade ago. Uh, and we, I have used those techniques many times since uh, in trying to find a route uh, to yes with uh, local communities and uh, local uh, politicians to, to try and figure out how to make a project happen. Uh, and usually there is a route, you know, the, the two sides, as it were, uh, usually have a lot more common ground than they realize that it just has to be communicated and uh, that just takes time and energy to go through all of that uh, to get there. And that, that probably was the most valuable thing that Macrahanish taught and uh, me and my my team. Well, we're certainly grateful that you were so persuasive uh, in in that mission because what's there now is anyone who who hasn't had the chance to be there is really uh, missing out on something very, very special um, and will continue to be so. Um, I wanted to ask you uh, a, a bit about your you know your overall approach to golf course design and it kind of relates to a question that that tommy southworth uh sent in which um in which he asked for a recreational golf course do you rec recommend defense of par defense of birdie or no defense at all and i you know it ties in a little bit to the you know the question of how difficult should a golf course architect look to make a golf course that is a really, really good question, and one that I have, uh, I would like to think I've uh, developed over my 30-year career thus far. Uh, are you guys able to see the pictures that I'm putting up on my screen? Yeah, we sure can. Okay, so that is the 18th green at the Castle Course at St Andrews that opened in 2008 that I was lucky enough to win the commission for. So you can see how stiff the wind's blowing there. You're about 100 feet up uh, above the North Sea. Uh, you're looking over to Carnoustie on the other side uh, of the water there. Uh, and you can see that there is a lot going on. There's a lot of shaggy rough. There's a lot of bunkers. Uh, making par on this hole, par five, dog legs around the cliff, uh, is a challenge. It's a, if you can make par here, 
it's going to feel like a birdie. I uh, and this was right about the point that I had a bit of an epiphany, uh, where I started to figure out that when I opened Band and Dunes, I uh, I wasn't really influenced by American golf design or American golf media. Uh, I, I really didn't have any of that influence. I was uh, unsullied, as they would say on Game of Thrones, uh, but not the same way as those, by the way. Uh, so golf to me was this simple game played across a beautiful landscape and the weather was a lot to do with the defense of the golf course. Uh, and as Ban and Dunes opened to great acclaim and people came and played, uh, it was all too apparent that the, the average guest was the average golfer. You know, he was trying to break a hundred uh, and he was having fun doing it with the same golf ball. And whether it was rain or shine, uh, he got to hit it, find it, and hit it again. And he wasn't embarrassed. He wasn't getting too frustrated. Uh, and that was part of the magic of Bandon. It's part of the magic. So fast forward a decade, uh, I, I get my choice of commissions. Uh, the magazines are telling me that I'm uh, really pretty good at this stuff. Uh, and if I want my golf courses to be ranked amongst the best, uh, they need to defend par. They need to be extremely challenging. Uh, they they can't allow wanton scoring. And so over the next decade, I became more and more influenced by this thinking uh, that golf courses needed to be uh, challenging, uber challenging. Uh, and then right around the, the recession, the last major recession hitting, I started to wonder if... Uh, if, a, if the same guy went to Band and Dunes and then the next day played the castle course, even though I had done both, my ethos was on both, the same guy, what would his thoughts be? And I knew it. I knew already what the answer was. At the castle course, he'd probably lose half a dozen balls and he'd be lucky to shoot 120 uh, and he'd be frustrated. And of course, the golf course won a lot of uh, prestigious awards. It was voted, you know, best new course of the year. And, uh, you know, it's still high in the rankings in Scotland. I think it's in the top 50, uh, but it's really challenging. And I started to wonder, is that really what golf is about? Uh, should I really be defending par? Is par not, if you really think about it, is par not a push? I mean, if we were playing match play and we both make seven, that's a push. Uh, you know, nobody won. So if we're playing match play and it's just me against the golf course, there's no other player. It's match play in my head. If I make par, isn't that a push? Nobody won. Course didn't beat me and I didn't beat it. So the defense of par seemed strange to me. Maybe I should be defending birdie. You know, that's where the more aggressive golfer is trying to cut corners, is trying to get into tight pin positions so that they can make a one putt. So I started to change my ethos and go back to what Bandon had so uh, perfectly shown me through uh, my instincts. You know, I didn't have to think to build Bandon. It was all instinctual. Uh, and I'd lost the, that instinct over the, the next 10 years. So I went back to Bandon and I really thought through what made those that course so successful. And it, it is about the average guy who's trying to break 100 with the same ball and not having to hunt the ball and not having to four putt, even three putt. I know he, he wants to go out and socialize with his buddies, not be embarrassed or frustrated, not be hunting golf balls and have some opportunity for success on any given hole. And if you can provide that as a golf course architecture, uh, as a golf course architect, then the, the fun factor blossoms the the golfers start to have real fun so if i could take you on a journey what happened was the very next golf course we got to build uh was a course in nicaragua i uh, called uh, guacalito de la isla uh, and we built this for a guy uh, from nicaragua uh, let me see if i can find a decent picture of this And we took that ethos and we tried to deliver it on the golf course. We tried to figure out how do we make the golf course as playable as possible for the guy that's trying to shoot bogey golf. This is the third hole. You see this giant sweep coming in from the left 
and the green is falling softly away from you from the left to the right. It's a par three. So for the average golfer, the wind could be, blow you see the flag, it's probably blowing 15 miles an hour or 20 miles an hour in that picture. The average golfer would be very intimidated by that stiff crosswind coming in off your left shoulder. So they're probably going to want to use that ramp up there on the left to hit the ball low and deep and get it to bounce down onto that green. And then at that point, they know they have a chance at a two putt. Your average guy is gonna, or girl is gonna go for that. The really good player who, who isn't intimidated by the, the distance or the wind, they're not gonna use that big bank slope off the left. That's not gonna get them close. So they're gonna try and judge the wind. Maybe they're gonna try and draw it into that wind. They're gonna try and take some kind of dead aim to put it stiff pin high and make a one putt. So the changes that I brought to my design ethos that tried to make the golf courses much more fun and player friendly for the average golfer, I'm not sure they make that much difference to the, the low handicapper because he doesn't look at that big bounce slope on the left and see it as an actual scoring opportunity. They're, they're taking dead aim at that pin, at which point the wind or those big deep bunkers come into play. Uh, and they're affected by those. So there were lots of examples uh, that I could show you. Uh, the one that I quit, not that this is a good example, it's just a really cool picture. Uh, it's only in Nicaragua you can do something like that. Uh, this green, I had the opportunity of parking this uh, 18th green right on the beach. Uh, wow. And the, the owner said to me, well, what happens when we get a tsunami or a giant tide? Uh, and I told him, well, it might cost $50,000 to rebuild that green if and when, probably when it ever happens. But I guarantee you that that's the picture you'll want to show people when they, they want to come down and play golf and stay in your hotel. Uh, and this course opened in 2011, so almost a decade ago. And so far, touch wood, no tsunami, no big storm, the green's still there. Uh, so. We built that uh, and it was a huge success. The players that came down loved it. Uh, it, it isn't massively challenging. Uh, so it allowed people to play golf and enjoy it. So feeling uh, vindicated, I came back to the US for my next project and I thought, okay, you know, what can I do uh, in the US to try and take this ethos and maybe dial it up a little bit more uh, and deliver it back to uh, a, a US audience. So the next course I built was this one uh, in central Washington, it's called Gamble Sands. Uh, and it's built on a sandy bluff high above the Columbia River. Uh, and it's I think it's the highest ranked golf course in the state of Washington, even above Chambers Bay. And the players love it. It's very remote, it's three hours plus from Seattle, two hours from Spokane and yet 20,000 golfers a year. It's only open for a few months in the summertime and uh, make the trip uh, and drive here to play it. That's the kind of view it has. Uh, so this is a, a short par four. Uh, it's only 300 odd yards from uh, the back tee. The, the average player, short par four, is probably laying up short of the, the bunker uh, in here or maybe trying to hit it over that bunker in there but the really good players are trying to thread this needle and roll it down onto the green for a, an eagle opportunity. So finding refinement on that playability question, how can I protect the scoring option, scoring being birdies and eagles and such, uh, but allow the average player a chance to make a reasonable par and not be hunting golf balls. And it's all about giving them options, giving them places to potentially miss or at least lay up into and giving them width most of all uh, and reducing rough. You can see in this photograph, the roughs here uh, are uh, maintained in a way where it's very easy to find a golf ball. You might not love the lie, but you're not gonna be asking three of your buddies to come hunt it. So the golf is quick. People are able to wander out, find a ball and play on and you're never really out of the game. You're not, you're not lost ball and in your pocket all of which adds to making golf that much more fun. Right, absolutely. You know, it relates to another question that we got from a, a member at Willow Bend, um, Eric Levin uh, wrote in and said he was wondering about your thoughts 
on extremely contoured greens showing up in many new designs. For example, the greens at Stream Song Black, which re resemble more of a ski mogul hill than a typical green. You know, I've played Stream Song Black a couple of times. I, uh, you know, it, it in particular, uh, Gil Hans tried uh, a, a kind of newish idea. It had only been done a few times before where he took the putting surface and then he took the, the edges of the putting surface as they fold away, usually down, and he grasped the whole entire thing in the same grasp. So basically the, the, the top of, of the shape, the putting green effectively, but all of the surrounds and mogul bumps are all in a very, very tight grass. So to the, uh, the untrained eye, I guess, it seems like the whole entire green is just surrounded in, in ski mogul bumps. Uh, and I think what Gil hoped was people would bump and run or lob or, or putt from, a, from those green surrounds and those tight lies, and the pin would really not leave the, the flatter tops. Uh, but in reality, what happened was people went out and saw the whole entire area as a green. And so only saw the option to putt. And quite often the shapes are so severe that putting that ball uh, becomes a real crapshoot. You just don't know what it's going to do. Uh, and so the, the idea, I think, uh, was a challenging one to, to do and um, it, with mixed success. Some love it, some hate it. Uh, I've done my fair share of wild putting greens. Uh, you know, the castle course at St Andrews has some pretty severe putting surfaces. All of the changes that I've done there over the last decade have mainly been to soften the greens. You can see here the picture that's up. This is the fourth at Gamble Sands. This is much more akin to what I'm used to doing these days. Uh, I, I try and build larger greens with a few larger shapes. Uh, within that green, maybe there's some very soft shakes almost, just ripples that exist uh, as well. But the whole ski mogul thing, I'm over it. I, it seems frustrating to me to hit a green in regulation and then be staring down the barrel of a three or even a four putt. So the general rule of thumb I use is that if I get within 15 feet of a pin, I really don't want it to break more than a couple of cups. And if I'm inside five feet, I don't really want it to break more than a cup. Uh, and I have built greens that from 15 feet away, it might break three cups three times. And that can be frustrating. Uh, and I'm not sure it adds to the enjoyment of golf. Maybe for the very, very best golfers who can play a second shot within six feet. Uh, you know, I, I co-designed a golf course, the only co-design I've ever done in London with uh, Tom Watson. And we were laying out a, a par four that was about 340 yards or so, in a shortish par four. And I was strategizing the bunkers and debating with Tom back and forth. Uh, and I said to Tom, you know, wh where would you hit your driver? And Tom said, well, I wouldn't. I just hit six iron. I said, every time? He said, sure, I just hit a six iron, you know, up the right side. And I said, well, that would leave you an eight iron in instead of a wedge. And he said, yeah, but I could put an eight iron to eight feet every single time. I could put a wedge to four. So four feet, six feet, eight feet, eh, probably one putt, half of them. So it made me realize that when you're that good, uh, it, it's a completely different place that you're in. Your head's in a completely different place. You know, with an eight iron, I'm hoping to hit the green. Uh, with a wedge, maybe I'm trying to get within 20 feet of the pin. But with any iron, I'm, I could easily miss the green. Yeah, me too. <laughs> um, there's there's kind of a related question from uh, one of the people on the Southworth team, Avanti Bot. Um, an interesting question. She's asking, what's the craziest concept you ever wish to implement on a golf course? Oh, that's a good one. So uh, a few years back, uh, Mike Kaiser uh, hired me to build another course for him in Wisconsin uh, that ended up being called Mammoth Dunes. Uh, and Mike and I had long conversations over months, years uh, about my 
career, my trajectory, how, how these things I'm talking about uh, were coming to pass from, from Band and Dunes to the Castle Course to Gamble Sands in Washington and how my uh, theories on golf and what makes golf good and fun had de developed over, the, over that time. And so Mike hired me to build what became Mammoth Dunes. And I really went, I doubled down on everything I had, had been thinking. And one of the thoughts that I had was, could I build a green that was in fact a horseshoe, uh, where the putting surface uh, was a complete and utter horse, horseshoe, uh, to the point where you couldn't even see a player from one side of the green to the other. Uh, and I worked hard to see if I could build it. And this is it. This is the sixth green at Mammoth Dunes. And as you can see, the size of that pin, that pin's seven feet tall. The mound that's in front of it is that the players are playing from the far distance. Uh, it's a short par four. You can be on either side of that green, green and not see the other player. However, you can put a ball from either side of that green all the way to the other side. Uh, and I, I had a hankering after doing something like this, and I found a particular piece of land on the site that was shaped in such a way that with a little adjustment, I could actually build a green that was a, an entire horseshoe and be able to putt it from one side to the other. So I'd say so far that might be, uh, aside from the green that was on the beach in Nicaragua, uh, this was probably the boldest idea that I'd I'd had to date. Uh, and when I had it, I did speak to Mike and say, you know, how crazy do you think that is? And he said, well, try it, try and build it. And if if uh, if I think it's crazy, I'll tell you you can't do it and I'll make you change it. And I said, OK. And so we did it. And when it was all in sand, I, we soaked the sand down and I, I brought a, a full size basketball out and Mike came out and I showed him that with a basketball, I could actually roll the basketball like a bowling pin all the way around the green from side to side. Uh, and he had no hesitation. He said, I love it. Go ahead, build it, finish it. And so the green you see now uh, is one of the most spoken about on the golf course. People just can't help themselves. Even if the pin's in the front, they can't help but pull out and then try and just put a ball all the way around it to see what happens. However, that's not the end of the story because I then took this idea and I, uh, I, I literally twisted it one more time uh, and we're building a green that's another twist on this one right now that will get grassed in the next few weeks. Uh, so stay tuned and, uh, and maybe there'll be some pictures of it in a magazine somewhere. That is incredibly cool. And isn't that half the fun of, of playing golf on you know Lynx courses or this style of golf course where you're really encouraged to use your creativity and figure out a way to get from point A to point B. And it may not be a direct line, you know, might be playing 90 degrees away from the hole, but getting the ball to roll to the hole. It is that fun. Well, I, I think that's where the essence of the game is in Scotland is that uh, brute strength and golfing prowess can be matched on a classic links course with a little guile, uh, imagination. If you can think something up, you don't have to have a high arcing six iron with a mount and a backspin. You could have, you know, a low chippy rescue club uh, and you can read the contours and judge the bounce and roll and see what happens next. Uh, and a, a, a player who made who doesn't have that kind of a uh, brute strength can beat the guy with all the power in the world on a links course because that guy with the high arcing shot can't stop it if the greens are hard. Now that, that, that is the one thing that levels the playing field for so many golfers is firm conditions. You add firm conditions and you will get a different winner every week on the PGA Tour. But if the conditions are soft, they're gonna throw darts and the guy who's the most accurate is gonna win. Right, which at the end of the day is, you know, ends up being kind of boring. So, uh, David, I wanted to ask you just real quick uh, what you're working on now and what you're excited about, you know, that's coming down the pike for your design company. Uh, we're working on a few different things. We are uh, doing some remodels. We just remodeled a club in Seattle uh, called Sandpoint Country Club. We're just about to remodel one in southern Utah, about 100 miles north of Vegas, called Entrada. 
Uh, we're consulting on numerous clubs on the West Coast from uh, Rancho Santa Fe, where Mickelson uh, is a member, uh, and a number of others. Uh, new builds, we are uh, working on a, a Lynx course in California that doesn't have a permit yet, but we're, we have all fingers and toes crossed uh, that that might come to pass. We've been working on it for a number of years, and we hope that we're nearing the finish line, but it is the great state of California, so it might outlive me, who knows. Uh, uh, there's a, a lot of different things going on. We're working overseas where we have a, another Lynx course in Portugal that we started many years ago that floundered, that has a new owner that hopefully we'll get back to finish. Uh, we're working in the Middle East uh, on another site uh, that's all sand. So right now we're really lucky. We're, we're fairly busy and we're working on a lot of sand. Some of it is uh, cool as in cold and some of it is hot as middle of the desert hot, uh, but sand is still sand. It's uh, the elixir of golf course architecture. The minute you're on heavy black soils, things get a lot more difficult. Not that we haven't done our fair share, but it is a lot easier in sand. Right, absolutely. Well, I wanted uh, to open it up and see if there are any questions from any of our attendees. I'm hoping there are some attendees. Yeah, we have some. Um, I don't see any questions in the questions area. And we've been going almost an hour. I guess, you know, maybe the last thing I would uh, I would be curious about, David, is, you know, if 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 you could, you know, touch just real quickly on, you know, what what have your influences been? You know, what are the what are the courses, whether it's from the golden age or the you know the links courses you grew up on um, you know are there are there a few that you point at and say you know that's the as close to a perfect golf course as you can get and I want to do courses like that you know I, I I love golf and I love the 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 landscape that golf has played across I try I try hard not to be overly judgmental I I. I've been lucky enough to play many of the finest golf courses on earth, whether it's Sunningdale or Pine Valley or Oakmont, you know, I, I Cypress Point. I mean, I, I can list them off like many of your uh, members can. Uh, but I've played plenty of little mom and pop golf courses, especially in the British Isles, that were more than worthy of my time, that I really loved playing, that were contrary and unexpected and peculiar and unique uh, and I love finding those and playing those and understanding appreciating that as golfers we we're playing a sport but we are uh, at one with nature we are exploring uh, a landscape and that is vitally important to our enjoyment uh, of this pastime uh, if we go out on a square flat field that has 18 perfectly acceptable golf holes, would that be as much fun as, as traversing across and through a landscape that's diverse and dynamic, and you're doing so in a very unexpected way, turning corners and crossing over yourself and not quite knowing what's coming next? I think that is, is an integral part of golf, is feeling that sense of exploration and mystery. Uh, and that I can appreciate that on the very best of golf courses and sometimes on the very most modest of golf courses uh, and try and emulate those things on the courses that we get to create try and figure out what can i do to create excitement and uh, exceed expectations in your members how do i get one of your members to go play something i did and have them shake their head and smile when they turn a corner and they see something like this boomerang green in a direction they weren't expecting, uh, and then wonder, what the hell is this guy? What is coming next? What, what am I going to see next? And that is pure joy as a golf course designer to be able to deliver that or try hard to try and deliver, the, deliver that. Absolutely. Which one very quick last question um, about that. Is there, is there a third golf course in those dunes in Makrahanish? Makrahanish. 
well done yeah you said it right this time uh sure i think there is yeah the the the, the beach uh runs from westport to macrahanish village uh and mac the the first third of those dunes uh, has the old course on the middle section has macrahanish dunes on and then there's a the final section to the north that a uh, extends up to what's called Westport uh, and there's easily another 18 holes in there. Uh, whether there's demand for it, whether uh, you could get the permitting to build it, the, the dunes are maybe the best of, of all of the dunes that are there. Uh, the views are spectacular because you're looking back towards the village uh, from one end of the bay. Uh, I, I think it probably will happen at some point, but would it be within my lifetime? I, I have no idea. Well, let, let's hope that it is, and let's hope that you get a chance to build it. And uh, But for now, David McClay Kidd, thank you so much for joining us and, and, and sharing all these great thoughts. We wish you all the best, and hopefully the, the COVID-19 situation goes away soon, and you can get back to globetrotting around the world and building these great fields of dreams for golfers. Well, I appreciate it, David. Thanks to you and your listeners. I appreciate it. Stay well, stay safe, stay uh, healthy. Cheers. Same to you, David. All the best. Bye. Good night.